Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this uh, first keynote lecture of uh, the Art of Wellbeing uh, Week. Uh, it's great to be here uh, sharing some thoughts about uh, well-being uh, in the 20th, uh, 21st century uh, in the workplace and in our lives. Um, before I begin with the topic at hand, just one practicality. So I would really appreciate it if you could turn on your cameras, because now I'm here in this great studio setting at the Mezzo restaurant at Dipoli. Uh, and for once, like, you know, we can have this lecture so that I actually can you know, see a bunch of you, uh, rather than like, you know, staring at the green light on top of my computer, which is basically the new normal of doing these types of talks these days. So, really great to see all of you here, uh, or there, as it goes. Uh, and so, today's topic is 21st century wellness. And by that, I mean uh, some sort of themes about well-being uh, at work, well-being in our everyday lives. Um, themes that have previously been such that I've been addressing them more like in the context of the future, of work. Uh, and I've previously thought that many of these themes that I'll be talking about today would be actually like, you know, uh, part of our everyday lives, maybe around 2030 or thereabouts, hence 21st century wellness. However, like, you know, as we've all seen, like, you know, in the last six months, uh, many of these uh, sort of changes that we've been anticipating in work life, uh, like self-directedness, intrinsic motivation, uh, working uh, at a distance, using digital tools, and so on and so forth. So a bunch of this stuff has actually now materialized in our lives uh, pretty much universally uh, in the Western countries and, well, uh, altogether globally. So I've prepared a couple of themes for you that I want to uh, share some uh, thoughts about. So first of all, I just want to sort of review the present situation we are in. What does it actually mean? Like, you know, what does it entail, especially if we, you know, go back to something like not back, but go to something that will eventually become the quote unquote new normal. Uh, then I'll address a couple of like more practicalities about like how we could actually like improve our uh, well-being in the present setting. I'll talk, talk a little bit about intrinsic motivation and self-directedness. Uh, about uh, why this sort of like, you know, what's, which is especially like important here at Alto, this idea of entrepreneurial mindset actually like gives us a lot of tools to tackle with the present challenges. Um, I'll talk a little bit about like, you know, setting priorities and like, you know, to, to figure out this sort of like new way of thinking about work altogether uh, based on this uh, distinction coined by a pioneer in, in behavioral economics, Herbert Simon, uh, aka the dis uh, distinction between satisfying and maximizing. And finally, I'll, I'll conclude with some remarks uh, taken from the startup scene in how we can actually navigate this unknown, highly dynamic, highly uh, unpredictable situation in life that we are right now. In a way, one might say we are all now in a situation not that different from what you know, a startup uh, entrepreneur faces every day. So uh, my name is Lauri Järvilehto. Uh, I'm the professor of practice at the Department of Industrial Engineering and Management and uh, in the field of uh, technology ventures and the co-director of Alta Ventures program or the entrepreneurship education uh, program uh, in Alta University. Uh, and, and prior to coming here, so I've been in Alta now for a little less than a year and a half. And before that, I actually worked as an entrepreneur for 20, uh, 22 years. So I've, I've started four companies. Uh, the first one was a music business. Uh, the second one, uh, I went back to the school, back, back to school and got myself a PhD in theoretical philosophy, uh, and then started a company called the Academy of Philosophy or Philosophy and Academia. Then I had a very short technology startup, and then the fourth one was a learning game studio called Lightnear that I started with the founders of the gaming company Rovio. Uh, with the aim of making great learning games uh, for children. And all of this has sort of like, you know, given me a kind of a landscape that is especially rooted into the sort of like two main pillars. So one of them is that I'm, I'm like a huge geek. I'm like, like, I love my books. I have this like huge collection of books, both at the office here uh, and at home. And I'm like, I love to try to figure out things on a sort of theoretical level. But 
if you just get, get sort of stuck, with, stuck up with theory, uh, it's not enough. So I've always been also driven to kind of, and that's why I probably ended up being like a serial entrepreneur, uh, that I've always been sort of keyed in also on in figuring out like, you know, how to make, uh, you know, get mileage out of these theories, how to make them, you know, actually uh, wor be worth something. And there's a really great uh, saying uh, in, in William James's book, Pragmatism, where he actually says that theories uh, should be seen as tools and not as some like, you know, final uh, illumination about how the world works. And I think that actually applies amazingly well in the present situation when, you know, basically you go to Twitter and everybody is a corona expert, but actually even the best of the actual experts don't really know what's going on. So the thing is that, I mean, if you want to navigate this type of uncertain terrain, I, I want to share, with, share some tools that have, you know, theoretical basis in them, but, I, but are also, one way or the other, uh, also tried and tested in practice. So it's not just sort of like the ivory tower speaking down to the uh, mere mortals, uh, but rather a combination of the theoretic and the practical. Uh, because I, I think, you know, one without the other, like theory without practice is void, practice without theory is just like foolishness. So, so combining the both is, I believe, the correct way to do. And now in terms of like, you know, for example, evaluating everything that's going on around us, you know, concerning the virus and everything, uh, I think the key takeaway is that we should always like take as our default whatever like you know the kind of scientific um, theoretical framework gives us, but then be capable of also evaluating in our own life circumstances, in our own situation, whether that theoretical framework applies or not. So have a type of like you know individual dynamics while still trusting that you know we have amazing scientific minds at work trying to crack this conundrum that we are all uh, now facing facing in the world <clears throat> so uh, i would venture to say it's not an exaggeration to say that we are living in the largest crisis uh, humanity has faced since the second world war uh, it's certainly something that that has redefined thoroughly our everyday practices, our lives, uh, our, our work, uh, where we work from, the way we work from, like, you know, it has brought about this whole new, uh, like, standard for so-called business formal attire, which is basically a suit and tie and, you know, your underwear and, and, and stuff like that. So basically, uh, things have radically changed. And now if you look into, like, you know, what's actually caused this change, uh, and what is, uh, what is actually the driver in these themes that I've been, uh, I'm, 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 I'm intending to talk about uh, a little bit more in a bit. So what is kind of like, like the, um, the driver is two things. So the first one is that the world as we know it is changing uh, exponentially faster. And this is due to the simple fact that, you know, uh, the technology that we use is uh, feeding into itself, especially in terms of uh, information. So if 500 years ago information uh, got like distributed very slowly and very locally, we're now uh, living in a hyper global, uh, hyper speed information age. So like five, 500 years ago, if you got an idea, that idea would probably reach, you know, your closest people uh, around you, uh, uh, in yeah, like your home village, more or less. And the time it would take for that idea to dissipate in your home village would be measured in weeks or months or years even. Now think about today, like, you know, if you get an idea now during this lecture, for example, and you go and put it on Twitter, and it may be like two seconds later, somebody in Australia goes like, hey, now, like, I realized finally something great when I read this tweet. Uh, and that means that all of a sudden these ideas which generate this technology, which generates the speed that these ideas uh, spread, has become this self-feeding cycle that has brought about all of these uh, challenges that we, are, we have been facing in the recent years, especially concerning automation uh, and the work, uh, the job market dynamic. Uh, depending on, on, on the articles uh, or, or the research, uh, there's a bunch of uh, research that points out that almost 50% of the present day uh, jobs available, I mean, not jobs, but the actual like uh, fields of work 
uh, will uh, dis disappear in the next 10 years. So there's a paper from Oxford University from 2013 that evaluates that the figure is roughly 47%. There's a bunch of data from like McKinsey and other uh, like uh, consulting analysts uh, that place the figure in the same ballpark. And, and there's a great uh, MIT meta-analysis on this data that also ends up giving a range of 10 to 15 percent, but leaning more towards the uh, 10 to 50 percent, but leaning more towards the 50 percent. So the moral of the story is that, you know, the world is changing faster and due to that change, things are like, you know, apt to develop faster and those developments are apt to change, especially the job market. So the old sort of like system where we go to school, we learn something, then we go to work somewhere like, you know, to apply what we've learned, then we can, you know, retire, we get the golden watch and we can finally do whatever we want in our lives when we're 65 years old. So that system doesn't work anymore. Uh, but even on top of this, so this is already sort of old news, like I mentioned, like, you know, that the, especially the, the first like massive uh, waves made from this uh, research already took place seven years ago. But there's another uh, effect uh, that is derived from uh, roughly the same basis, especially from the, you know, the, the hyper-globalization of the planet right now. So, and this, this phenomenon is what Nassim Taleb, a, a famous theorist and former uh, stock market analyst, uh, stockbroker, uh, uh, calls the black swan. So you guys know the black swan, like, you know, is this like famous classical philo philosophical metaphor for like, you know, something that is outrageously impossible to predict. Uh, because the history goes that like, you know, back in the day, there was even like, you know, the way the scholastics used to teach Aristotelian logic was like using these all swans are, are white sort of like, you know, truisms or uh, sayings. Uh, because basically everybody assumed that swans are white. It was like what they call an inductive uh, uh, truth because every single swan that we'd seen so far in the history of humankind was uh, white. Until, you know, we went to Australia, encountered these black things, and then all of a sudden this whole like, uh, like pseudo-logical idea was thrown away. Uh, and what Nassim Taleb means by a black swan is a massive... Uh, event that has significant consequences that is impossible to predict. And I put the emphasis on it's being impossible to predict because this is like, you know, there's obviously a bunch of things that are hard to predict. Like, you know, who's going to win the election in the US this year? Who knows? Like, you know, I mean, the polls say one thing, but the polls could be wrong. Uh, and we don't really know, but we have like, you know, a bunch of stuff bunch of ways we can uh, try to predict that and you know in all likelihood we'll still have the two options and one of them is going to prevail uh, hopefully the saner one but who knows so that's kind of like you know uh, what a predictable event looks like but a unpredictable event is something like you know what happened with corona or what happened with the 2008 financial crisis or what can happen to organizations like apple and smartphones where a black swan to nokia I mean, nobody at Nokia could see them coming. And there's an even famous, like, you know, uh, front page from Talos Sanomat that, you know, does the rounds in social media every now and then where Ansi Vanioki, the, I think, then operational, uh, chief operational officer of Nokia, uh, welcomed Apple to the competition in, smartphone, in phone markets because smartphones will never be more than a niche product. Well, they, you know, turned out to be way more than a niche product, right? And that was a black swan uh, moment for Nokia. So a black swan is an unpredictable event uh, that has massive consequences. And we, all of us, know probably very well what that means in practice because we're living with one right now. Uh, so, you know, regardless of the fact that, like, we've been talking about pandemics hitting, you know, for ages. There's even, even a movie with Dustin Hoffman called Outbreak from, I think, like late 90s or something like that. I don't know if you guys remember that movie, but they had these huge helmets on and like stuff like that and really scary stuff. Uh, but regardless of these predictions, even in, in, in January when stuff started happening in Wuhan, uh, like al almost nobody uh, could actually predict what would happen in a few months globally, that we'd actually lock down move home, start working from home, and start working uh, with this like, whole new uh, framework of intrinsic motivation. And this happened because we didn't have the appropriate way to, to predict this type of event because it didn't ensue from what we already know. Uh, so 
Nassim Taleb gives this, I think, rather delicious metaphor uh, of, of the turkey. We should aspire not to be a turkey. Uh, now, if, you know, if you're American or aware of the American culture, this uh, might, might make sense to you. In Finland, I sometimes also uh, use uh, the metaphor of the pig instead, because that might make more sense. But let's talk a little bit about the turkey. So if you think about you know, the life of a turkey, it's, it's a pretty good life. You wake up in the morning, you eat your you know, belly full, you go around the yard, you may meet your fellow turkeys, you, know, you have a little you know, uh, fun time with them, then you eat some more, and then you go to bed. And then you wake up in the morning, you eat, you have fun time with your friends, you eat some more, you have more fun, and then you go to bed. And rinse and repeat. And now, as this turkey has lived for, let's say, like a thousand days, it will assume that, you know, turkey life is amazing. I love to be a turkey. It's just eating, sleeping, having fun. Perfect. Uh, <clears throat> but then if day number two, 1001 happens to be the day before the Thanksgiving Day in the U.S., well, it's not so much fun to be the turkey anymore. And this is like, you know, the way the human mind processes information. We assume that every day will be more or less the same as it was before, except that when something unpredictable happens. Now, it looks like that this unpredictability, like I already mentioned in passing, it arises from the same source mm, as, as, as the, 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 um, the change in technology, namely this hyper-global nature uh, of our world. So in 1920, you know, if somebody had caught the corona in Wuhan, uh, you know, a bunch of people in Wuhan would have gotten sick, they would have had that disease for a while, and then that would have been that. But now enter, you know, the air bridge from China to northern Italy, the whole like hyper-connectedness of the world, and we have a pandemic. So the same phenomenon, the fact that all of these beautiful things that have arisen from this hyper-connectivity and this hyper-globalization, all of these things have also put us at greater risk of these uh, massive events taking place. And now I think the, the important bit here is, it's not that like, you know, hey, but I mean, we had the financial crisis, but we don't give subprime loans anymore. Or like now we have the corona, but once we, once we get the vaccination, then like, you know, then we're all good to go. No, the moral of the story is that something else is going to happen sooner or later. And given the, you know, the facts right now, it's probably going to happen sooner. And that means that this whole idea that we can predict the tomorrow uh, from the yesterday puts us in a position that if we still keep on adhering to that, we're going to be the turkey. So now the question is, what should we then do? And like I mentioned in the beginning, in a sort of way, we are all now living in a in similar uh, situation as a startup entrepreneur lives uh, every day of their lives. Namely, we are facing an unpredictable, uh, highly dynamic, highly hard to predict uh, ecosystem in which we need to operate every day. And that means that we don't have the luxury of spending five years planning for a new strategy because by the time we've finished that strategy, it will be perfectly tailored for a world that doesn't exist anymore. So rather, we need to start thinking in a new way, in a more dynamic way. And the beauty of this situation here is that if we're actually able to do this, both as individuals, as organizations, and ultimately as a society, this may actually not be a curse, but actually a blessing in disguise for all of us. Because getting to that position where we can actually zone in on what we really care about, what really intrinsically motivates us, what really you know, gets us fired up in the morning, uh, that's altogether a way better proposition to build, you know, a working life, a society, than this old like block model where you have the school, the job, and then the retirement when like, you know, you're already old and hurting and you should then start figuring out what you want to do when you grow up. So we are in a situation where we can actually leverage also a bunch of stuff that's going on in the world. Uh, and luckily enough, uh, there's a bunch of research that really uh, helps us in this situation. So before I go into the next topic, I want to share uh, one more uh, idea from Nassim Taleb uh, that gives us the sort of like frame of mind of how we should think about uh, working, especially at the time of uh, Corona and other black swans. And also how to uh, inoculate ourselves against these types of unpredictable uh, situations. Uh, so in a later book, uh, Taleb, uh, it's, which is also titled after the main concept, talks about anti-fragility. 
Santa fragility uh, is, is a, it's a beautiful conceptual construct. And it means that originally Talib was actually thinking about how to make societies, organizations, and individuals robust, so strong against these black, one, black swan events. But as the years passed and as he did his research, he came to realize, I mean, at the end of the black swan book, there is actually like, you know, in the latest edition, there's even an app appendix dealing with how to make organizations robust enough for black swans. But he came to realize that robust, strong is not enough. Well, the thing is like, you know, if you're weak, if you're fragile, like, you know, like a crystal glass, whenever there's a big, outside hit to that glass, you know, if it falls to the ground, it shatters to pieces. So a fragile, a weak thing is something that breaks if it's hit. Now, if you're robust, if you're strong, then you have like, let's say a rock, and that gets hit by an outside force, and it just goes like, huh. And that's like, you know, it seems to be like, you know, the ideal thing. And obviously, like, you know, you can see some leaders in the civilized world that seem to think that like, you know, being the kind of strong person, like, you know, uh, the king of the hill is like the way to, you know, govern. But the problem with, is that with any amount of strength, there's always going to be some uh, quantity of the outside force that's going to be able to break you. Like, you know, if you're a rock and you meet the diamond drill, well, you know, Good luck being a rock then. And even the strongest or the most robust of things can become fragile. Now, anti-fragility means that you actually step outside the boundaries of fragility and robustness altogether. Uh, and, and what that means is like, you know, that if the crystal glass is fragile and the rock is robust, let's say like a school of fish is something that's actually anti-fragile. So they're swimming around in the water and like, you know, living their nice fishy lives. And then you throw in a huge rock in the midst of them. So what they do in an anti-fragile fashion is the huge thing happens and they move around it. And then after, you know, the dis this disruption uh, has ended, the, you know, the, the rock has sunk to the bottom, they move back together and then they start doing their nice fishy things again. So this is actually like what we would uh, want to adhere towards. Not being weak because that's how we get destroyed. Not being robust because that's how we become disruptors. But being anti-fragile. So being able to be dynamic enough ourselves in the face of these changes in the world. And I'll give you one more example and then move on to the next, uh, uh, next topic which actually will address how we can become more anti-fragile. So let's say that you're in a situation where... Um, uh, you know, Romeo and Juliet want to see each other and they've agreed now to have a date at the dancing ball. So Juliet is there waiting at the ball and Romeo comes to the ball and opens the doors. And what he sees is this huge banquet hall. Uh, it's filled with people from one wall to, to the other. And on the other side of these people dancing and having a good time is Juliet. So what's Romeo going to do? Now, if Romeo is fragile, He'll just stand there, like, you know, with lower lip going, la ba, and, and start, you know, teary eyed, like, look, oh, my loved one is there. Oh, how could I reach her? And he'll just, like, you know, collapse in the situation because he's met an obstacle. He's met a problem that he can't solve. Now, if Romeo is robust, if Romeo is like, you know, like some of these world leaders that I mentioned, he goes like, that is my loved one. I shall go there. And then he goes, boom, boom, and just like, you know, pushes everybody from the way. And then he, you know, takes his loved one to his arms and kisses her and la la la. And which is like, you know, off of the bat, you know, I mean, I understand why some people think that that's a good idea. Because like, you know, you get, to, you, you get what you want. You get your loved one, you get to the goal. But if you look behind you afterwards and you go like, and you see all those hundreds of people really peeved at you for what you have done. And ultimately, that's not going to be a winning strategy. Ultimately, as we see in world history throughout the last couple of millennia, at least, every single one of these people who have tried this strategy have had it eventually backfire in their faces. And I'm pretty sure we'll see this same thing happen with these certain world leaders as well. So now, what, what about if Romeo is anti-fragile? So he doesn't collapse in the face of the challenge, and he doesn't uh, drive his way through the obstacle but he rather uh, adapts to the obstacle. So what Romeo does, he comes to the banquet hall, he looks at the dancing people, he sees Juliet, he moves forward and he starts dancing with the other people. And he moves and he does a little pirouette here and there. And ultimately he comes to the other end of the, the dancing crowd, sees Juliet, uh, takes her into his arms and they kiss and they have a great night. And everybody has a good time. 
So that's what anti-fragility means, that you see, you face an obstacle that might seem insurmountable, and you start experimenting and doing all kinds of new things in order to surmount that obstacle, but in a way that doesn't you know, squeeze other people below you as you move forward. <clears throat> so these ne the next three uh, toolkits that I want to share with you are, in my understanding, uh, ways we can actually learn to be more anti-fragile in our lives. And the first of these is called intrinsic motivation. <clears throat> so intrinsic motivation and, and, and self-directedness have been themes that have been, especially in Finland, uh, a point of a lot of conversation in recent years. However, much of this uh, re conversation has uh, unfortunately been quite misconstrued. Uh, I've been involved a lot in this sort of school reform going on in Finland, especially with like, you know, the basic uh, elementary school uh, work. And I've, I've, I've been pained by year on year with these like, you know, big newspaper headlines claiming that intrinsic motivation is destroying our children. Like you can't just have children do whatever they want to do. You know, the parents and teachers must be there to set the boundaries to the children. And what is wrong with this, you know, first of all, this argument, you know, if it was actually based on some reality, it would be perfectly right. I mean, if intrinsic motivation would be just doing whatever, you know, you want to do at any given moment, then yes, you know, this uh, type of uh, setting boundaries would be precisely what you need to do. But the problem is that intrinsic motivation doesn't mean limitless freedom. And actually, if you go to a school, and you, you don't see this in Finnish schools almost ever because we have the best teachers on the planet, but if you go to a Finnish school, uh, if you went and, see, and saw a teacher who, let, who lets their children do whatever they want, that wouldn't be called uh, intrinsic motivation that would be called criminal abandonment of children. So, I mean, like giving any human being like unlimited freedom is actually toxic for our well-being, interestingly enough. Uh, and intrinsic motivation, if you take a look at the whole theoretical corpus of uh, research data developed uh, starting from 1970, uh, mid-1970s, uh, in the research of these Rochester psychology professors, uh, Edward Deasy and Richard Ryan, uh, if you take a look at these like uh, 45 years worth of research consisting in tens of thousands of research papers, uh, the result is pretty clear. Intrinsic motivation, mo being motivated by the activity itself as, to, you know, as compared to extrinsic motivation, being motivated by reward or punishment, uh, consists of being able to satisfy your psychological needs. And yes, freedom is one of the psychological needs, but it's the only, only the one that gets you started. The other two are competence or you know, getting things done, getting this feeling that you know, you're achieving things, getting to this flow stage where you're really sort of like, you know, uh, focused on something. I hope that tomorrow, like, you know, when Mona Moisla will be here talk, talking to you, uh, you'll learn some tips and tricks about like, you know, how to get better focus because that usually leads to better flow as well. Uh, and then, uh, relatedness or relationship with other, you know, authentic relationships with other people. So that you feel that in your social settings you don't have to put on a role, you don't have to be somebody you're actually not, but you can be precisely the type of person you are. Or like Oscar Wilde allegedly once said, uh, it's better to be yourself because everybody else is taken. Uh, so, and then ultimately, so DC and Ryan have identified these three parameters, three psychological needs that we all actually aspire to fulfill, just like we aspire to fulfill our physiological needs of eating, drinking, and sleeping. Uh, but then there's an interesting twist in the recent years. So in 2012, uh, I was uh, with my colleague and friend Frank Martela uh, in Moscow at the, the uh, annual, uh, or biannual, or how do you say it? It's every <laughs> once in two years. Uh, European uh, Conference on Positive Psychology. Uh, and there we met with Richard Ryan the first time, and in that conference Frank came up with this idea that actually it may be that there's a fourth psychological need, namely benevolence, or pro-sociality, as Frank now puts it scientifically. So basically he argued that there might be also that people have by and large the need to do good. 
And Richard Ryan's first reaction to this claim was, hmm, sounds interesting, uh, tell me more. And eventually Frank started working with him at the University of Rochester, and they're still collaborating on a bunch of papers. And the results seem to imply that yes, at least up to a point, people are also intrinsically motivated by fulfilling their psychological need to do good. So th this, what you see on the screen now, is a model that I built uh, eight years ago for my book uh, in Finnish, Upea Työtä, uh, where basically I've squeezed these scientific concepts into these three sort of alliterative ideas of freedom, flow, and fulfillment. So interesting motivation actually means that you have enough freedom to experiment like, you know, with what actually makes, you know, makes your heart sing. We're all highly unique. I mean, the idea that everybody should be great at everything, like, you know, it's, it's, it's a silly idea, fundamentally. What we should aspire to find is one or two things that we are really excited about, that we can really become great at, so that we can really experience these flow states in them uh, as we go on in our lives. And now, I mean, the flow state, uh, according to this uh, psycholo psychology professor, Mihai Csikszentmihalyi, uh, is uh, the optimal state of being human, uh, human being. So it's, it's the state where we enjoy, which is one of the most enjoyable uh, states, one of the most aspired towards states, uh, psychological states for a human. This state where your conscious mind almost melts away and you feel like, you know, that you get into this, well, flow of things, right? Uh, and, but flow alone is not necessarily a good thing. You can see these, like, once again, unnamed, uh, aforementioned world leaders giving speeches and they're in amazing flow. I mean, Adolf Hitler, when you, you know, if you've never seen that guy talk, take a look and you can see flow, abundance of flow even. Uh, but, you know, if that flow is directed not for the well-being of others, but for the detriment of others, then bad things happen. And that's why the third component, this uh, authentic sociality and pro-sociality, well, uh, so being able to be around people without putting on a role and being able to contribute towards the well-being of other people uh, becomes the third component in this intrinsic uh, motivation uh, uh, construction. Now, how do you get there then? Well, the beauty of it is that all of these three parameters feed into one another. So if you have enough freedom, enough free time every now and then to try things out, try to work out you know, what really makes your heart sing. Uh, if you don't have this like, you know, idea that I know what I'm, you know, what I'm supposed to do, one exercise that I personally like, really enjoy doing, and I've done it with like, thousands of Alta students and thousands of students like elsewhere, we once went through half of Finland's high schools, uh, is this uh, tool called the vocational map. So basically every two years or so, I write down on a piece of paper all the activities that I, that I enjoy doing because they're fun. Like, you know, like giving a lecture like this. Well, like this, it's, it's a little dodgy. I'd really prefer being in the same room with all of you. But it's still like, you know, it's sort of fun still. Uh, I love playing the piano. I love reading good books. I mean, and, and I write this stuff down. And then I try to figure out how would my life ideally be so that I could do these things as much as possible every day. So that's one tool that you can use. Uh, and if you don't uh, write many things on a list like that, if you feel like, you know, honestly, there's not that many things that really like make me so excited or even like, you know, that interested, not to worry. You can actually increase uh, your freedom by self-understanding. Like Socrates said in Plato's Apology, that life left unexamined is not life worth living at all. So actually like, you know, by starting to try things out, you'll be able to figure out in no time uh, new kinds of things that can actually make your heart sing. I've, I've asked this tens of thousands of people, how many of you people, now I can see some of you on the camera, this is amazing, like, you know, for once we can have interaction in a digital lecture. So please, if you love hang gliding, please raise your hand like this on the screen. No hands. Okay, how many of you have never tried hang gliding? Please raise your hands on the screen like this. How many of you have never tried hang gliding? Pretty much everybody that I can see. So how could you know if you love hang gliding or not? I've, I've asked this question tens of thousands of people and I have had one answer. One time when somebody actually in a, in a huge audience of like 800 people raised their, their hands and I shouted out to them like, you know, how, how do you know? And, and, and then she was like, you know, that, well, I mean, it's one of my hobbies. I love doing that. So she has been the only person in my experience who has actually, first of all, tried it and who loves that.
So if we don't try things out, it's impossible for us to really be able to differentiate what we love and what we don't love to do. And that's why if you're not able, I mean, if you're able to write down even, you know, five or six things that you love to do on a piece of paper, you're all set. Uh, <clears throat> if not, then you don't have anything to worry. You can every month or even every week try something new and see like how it feels to you. Uh, and I, even though I have a bunch of things that I really love to do, I still like to experiment and dabble in new stuff because it's, you know, you never know what, what might happen. And, and like, you know, the, the other day uh, we watched the Karate Kid movies with my kids. And I start, I've started ever since thinking like, it would be actually great to go to a karate class to like, you know, start working on this daniel San like, you know, uh, things. That was kind of a childhood dream that I forgot at some point. And that might be like, you know, one thing worth uh, experimenting with. Uh, moving on into the future. So the way you can increase freedom is through self-exploration, self-examination, figuring out like what really drives you, what do you really want to do, and then once you figure those out, start practicing them. And that moves you to flow. And flow is basically uh, a state of balance uh, between two opposites. Uh, so basically it's where your activity is challenging enough not to be boring, but not too challenging to become stressful. And this is the state of balance that we should always aspire to in our working life, in our free time, in our hobbies. How to find the kind of like the Goldilocks zone where the porridge is just right. And there's like, you know, if you can actually manage to do your activities mostly at the edge of the flow. So challenging yourself enough so that it's almost too difficult, but not quite. That means that you'll, you'll be able to learn new stuff every day from one day uh, to another. Uh, and that means that you'll be able to develop better competencies. And then finally, if you direct those competencies and try to find out, you know, for example, working here at Alta, we have a lot of like amazing things, how we can contribute to the well-being of the world at large. One of the things that I'm personally most inspired by is this uh, sustainable development goal accord that we've signed now about a year ago. So basically our organization is committed to not just like, you know, get to carbon neutrality or recycling our coffee cups. But what we're also doing is like, you know, really kind of trying, you know, trying to get to the point where this amazing amount of brain power, like our, our 12,000 students and almost 20,000 people in the Alta community altogether, how can, we can, how can we direct that brain power to solve some of these most pressing problems of humanity right now? And every single person in this organization can contribute to this goal, which up till now nobody has been able to figure out. And I envision like, you know, that with our new strategy and the, you know, the kind of uh, the three verticals of Alta University of art, technology and, and business and then new three horizontal themes of radical creativity, entrepreneurial mindset and sustainability. You know, Alta could even become this sort of uh, sustainable development goal solving machine that 10 years from now we would be pushing out constantly new types of uh, innovations and, and, and solutions to these problems like sanitation uh, and, and, and so forth. So I was talking about uh, intrinsic motivation and basi <coughs> basically so what it boils down to is these three components of freedom, flow and fulfillment. So freedom, self-exploration, figuring out what actually like you know makes you uh, like who you are, what excites you and making experiments and trying to figure out like you know what to do differently especially you know if what happens like as it now has that the world changes. Then flow finding those ways of really being able to focus on what you're doing, really being able to do the thing, kinds of things that you really love to do. And finally, fulfillment, directing all of that energy into doing something, you know, for the greater good, which like, you know, depending on the organization may be easier or, or more difficult to do, but especially I believe that in an organization like Aalto, you can actually like, you know, just by contributing to, you know, to the well-being of our students, to our staff, like, you know, being a great teacher, sharing your thoughts with our students. Uh, everything that we do here can contribute ultimately, first of all, to us giving a great education to our students, but second of all, with this new strategy also to be able to become more keen towards solving these pressing problems in the world. And freedom feeds to flow, flow feeds to fulfillment, and the more you do service to the others, the more you will have uh, freedom to explore, which leads to flow, which leads, leads to fulfillment, which leads to freedom. And this is the actual uh, research-backed picture 
of how intrinsic motivation works. So it's not just autonomy. And now looping back to that, a little caricaturized uh, public discussion that I referenced at the beginning of this conversation point. So actually, one of the biggest challenges with intrinsic motivation is how to balance freedom and flow. Because actually, uh, if you don't have any goals, any targets, anything that you aspire to do, and you have maximal freedom, that's actually toxic to our well-being because it's actually conducive to not being in flow, which is like the ideal state for the human being. Whereas if you have too strict guidelines and too strict goals, and you have to work from 8.04 till 16.07 in a particular fashion where all of your freedom is stripped away, that will also uh, be a bad thing. But when you find the balance of knowing what you need to do, what really matters, how you, how you can contribute, knowing what you want to do, and then exploring what, how to like, you know, balance these two together better. And finally, especially in this day and age, being able to, to prioritize what really matters. That way you can balance your freedom and flow so that it, feels, uh, it ultimately leads to doing good to others and thus fulfillment. And this is where the sense of meaningfulness uh, uh, that is really one of the most important things for uh, long-standing well-being for human beings arises from. So <clears throat> now freedom, flow, and fulfillment enable us to operate intrinsically motivatedly, self-directedly. And as we spoke over in the beginning, the whole world has almost overnight moved to a situation where we actually need all to be intrinsically motivated. And it's not always easy, even like, you know, for somebody like myself who studied this topic for, more, for almost 10 years, some, you know, some days are really hard in this day and age of Corona. And, and that's why like, I think one of the most important things uh, in understanding how to function in this new setting is to be merciful to ourselves, to really understand that we are in a crisis, we are in a highly atypical situation. And it's okay if you, know, if you don't get all the ball, balls in the air, if you're not like a hyper performer, like, you know, and that also begs the question of whether like, you know, being a hyper performer is a good idea in the first place. And I'll touch base with this th thinking a little bit uh, towards the end of the lecture. So another tool that we can use uh, to, to, to function in this present situation is learning uh, the entrepreneurial mindset. Uh, the entrepreneurial mindset doesn't mean uh, that you are uh, going to start your own company. Actually, you can have a very strong entrepreneurial mindset, you know, working for another organization. Then we often talk about this concept known as an entrepreneur. So, so a person who works for another organization where they're not like, you know, an owner or a founder, but where their way of working is highly entrepreneurial. By the way, it's the silliest thing, like, you know, like I mentioned in the beginning, I'm the co-director of the entrepreneurship education unit here in Alta, and I still can't properly pronounce the word entrepreneurial. And when I was actually applying for this professorship, they gave me the kind of, I had to give this uh, showcase lecture, uh, and the, the title for the showcase lecture was Leading Entrepreneurial Ventures. So you can believe how much fun I had trying to like, you know, have that lecture without saying that word a single time. <laughs> anyway. So the, the entrepreneur's mindset is something that's often quite fuzzy and hard to define. And after working on this more than one year here at Talto and trying to figure out, I think we have finally landed at something that really sort of nails uh, it down, what being uh, working like an entrepreneur or building like an entrepreneur, as we say at Alta Ventures program, what it actually means. Uh, and, you know, I mean, you... I think often people think that entrepreneurs are people who start companies. But actually, uh, last spring, when you know, the corona situation hit, uh, and my friend Johanny Mykkänen, who's uh, the chief marketing officer at Volt, which is like one of the most successful startups in Finland, so Johanny pointed out in Facebook that actually like, you know, what he's paid attention to is that the entrepreneur-like people around him are the people who, when they see that something is you know, wrong, something starts to bug them, to annoy them. Instead of starting to, you know, to complain about it, like you know, there is a mistake in the world, they start thinking about, hmm, how do I solve this? How do I make, you know, because this bugs me, so it must bug a bunch of other people as well. So maybe if I figure out how to solve this, you know, maybe I can actually make a business out of that. And this is actually how you can define the entrepreneurial mindset, <laughs> forgive me, uh, as, as, as best, in the best possible way. 
it is how do you relate towards problems. Now the classical sort of uh, corporate way of thinking about problem is that you try to uh, <coughs> try to avoid them as much as you can. You know, you make a problem and you might get fired even in a, in a like old-fashioned uh, organization. Uh, but and, and that leads that you try to stick with the old as much as you can. But you probably all can see where this is headed. If, if, you, go, if you go about problems in this fashion, you are the turkey. Because like, you know, there are going to be some problems that you just can't avoid, like the one that we're facing right now. So the entrepreneurial mindset, I almost got it right this time. So that, that really sort of like, you know, that means that when you see a problem, you don't move away from the problem but you move towards it. And in order to be capable of moving towards it, you learn tools for innovation and problem solving, uh, of, of credit, radical creativity, of trying to figure out like, you know, that what do I do if something happens that I couldn't predict at all? And that way you'll, you'll never be the turkey because even when something highly unanticipated, something totally unpredictable happens, you're able to start working on that. You can't solve it immediately. You need tools for that. But luckily enough, there are a bunch of tools out there that you can use. And, and ultimately, it's just a matter of learning you know, tools like for, uh, for, for creative thinking, ideation, uh, like teamwork, stuff like that. And one thing that I really want to share with you. So this January, my latest book came out. And it was a peculiar book in the sense that I actually wrote this book with my little brother, Paavo. Uh, it's, well, unfortunately, only in Finnish, uh, but it, uh, I at least assume that many of you guys can read Finnish. The book is called Pim Olet Luova. So, Bing, uh, you're creative. And, you know, if you've ever read Donald Duck, you might have an idea where that name is derived from. Uh, so, anyway, uh, in that book, we collected dozens of tools that we have used in our work. So, like for myself, like, you know, in, in, in the music industry, in writing books, in making lectures, uh, in designing games. And for my brother, who is one of the like, you know, most celebrated uh, ad designers, for example, he was in charge of making this campaign for Finnair called Runway on a Runway, where like top models would like perform uh, in the Finnair, uh, like the Helsinki Vantaa Runway. And, and we collected a bunch of tools. And the biggest takeaway that we found when we were putting the book together is that people often think that there are creative people and not creative people. But that's not at all true. Actually, every single human being is creative by virtue of being alive. So creativity is the capability of uh, adjusting your activities when the old way of working doesn't work. And the, the only thing that makes a difference here is what kinds of methodological tools we have at our disposals, at, at, our, at our disposal. So it's like similar, like you know, that every human being is creative, like in the same way that every human being more or less knows how to talk and walk. But we're not all creative. Like I mean, the difference seems to arise from like you know that we're not all as creative as Leonardo da Vinci or or like you know Mary Curie. Uh, and uh, that's because, like, you know, we're also not as great speakers as Winston Churchill or as great walkers as Valentin Kononen, who was the Olympic walker in Finland, like, you know, 10, 15 years ago. So, so the key difference is methodological. And I want to share one of the kind of, like, you know, key findings uh, in what, what is the most, like, powerful creative tool that you can learn. And it is uh, make notes. Have a notebook with you wherever you go. Make notes about every single small idea that you have. Because the way, the way the human mind works is that if you have, I mean, everyone, everyone has great ideas. But most people don't write them down. And five minutes later, you might not ev even remember what you thought about back then. And there's actually, like, in my first book, uh, I showcase some research that points towards the fact that for every conscious thought, a uh, human being processes about 280,000 non-conscious thoughts every given second. Uh, I hope that Mona will share more uh, insight about this type of like, you know, how this affects your uh, focus and stuff like that tomorrow. But the, the takeaway in this context is that if you really want to uh, engender creative thinking, uh, be uh, mindful of the boundaries of your mind's capability of processing information and make notes. And that will already take you far. And by engendering these creative tools, by cre learning to innovate over problems, whenever we're hit with a new problem, it's no longer a threat, but an opportunity that we can face confidently. And by understanding that we don't have the solution yet, that's where, where the creativity bit comes in. 
but we can start working on that. Or as it, this, like, you know, I think it's still on the wall of philosophy and academia, uh, but when we started the company, I printed these like little credit card size cards for all the employees that said like, you know, that I have no idea how to do it yet, but I'll figure it out. And that is the entrepreneurial mindset. Now, coming to the conclusion, Mm. So there is a beautiful uh, distinction by Herbert Simon, uh, one of the pioneers uh, of uh, behavioral economics, uh, <coughs> of satisfying versus maximizing. So typically in the classical setting, you know, in the school work that we've gone through in our, in our lives, in the corporate world, we try to maximize. So we try to make as good uh, decisions as possible. Uh, in a stable ecosystem, this is the perfect strategy because uh, by maximizing the amount of information we have, by strategizing over that information, by creating a set of goals and then executing over the, those goals, it's a perfect way to get things done. But it doesn't work if your ecosystem, as ours, is highly dynamic. So in comes the other alternative. The alternative where you understand that you won't be able to make perfect uh, decisions, you are going to make decisions that are going to fail miserably, and that is okay. That is okay to do things that don't work out, because nobody knows right now how we're supposed to cope. Even the best experts, like I said in the beginning, don't know how to cope with the present situation. So we're all groping in the dark, but we can grope with confidence uh, towards the solutions if we actually like, you know, uh, understand that we can be merciful to ourselves, that we don't really need to uh, kind of, how do you say that? Uh, we don't really need to kind of mm, like expect to succeed at the first goal. And that's where satisfying comes in. So satisfying means that instead of like gathering ginormous amounts of data to make the correct uh, decision, uh, you simply make a decision. And once you've made a decision, you see what happens. And if it works, good for you. If it doesn't, uh, you keep on looking for the other alternatives. And the important bit here is that if you don't introduce a learning component into this equation, then we're in trouble. But if you have a system where you try things out, so you make quick decisions, you see what happens, so you analyze the results, and then you learn from the results whether they succeed or not, then we have a winning proposition. Uh, and this uh, brings us into the situation <clears throat> where we can actually employ a lot of the learnings that the startup ecosystem has engendered in the last couple of years. So this final thing that I want to share with you uh, is a model uh, from one of these like biggest startup influencers in the world, uh, uh, a guy called Eric Ries, uh, who introduced this whole notion of the lean startup uh, some uh, roughly decade ago. Uh, and in, in Ries' model, uh, you have three main components that need, need to take place. So first, you build something. You don't build the perfect product, but you build a minimum viable product, something that like, you know, almost doesn't work, but like, you know, just about does. Then you measure what happens. You know, was it a good product? Wasn't it not? And then you learn from the measurement. And that means that you keep on failing towards success. And this is the way we can navigate, you know, no matter how dynamic the ecosystem becomes, we can keep on doing things, some of them succeed, some of them fail. As long as we keep on learning from the failures, we will move closer and closer to the models that actually work. And then all of a sudden, like, you know, all of these uh, dyna dyna dynamics uh, in the ecosystem becomes a growing platform for dynamism. So your capability of really adjusting the match between what really drives you and how you can service this world that keeps changing faster and faster. And that means that in order to do so, we need to learn to embrace failure, but not love failure. And this is a really important distinction. Often in media, when we talk about the startup ecosystem, uh, it's touted like, you know, that startup entrepreneurs love to fail. Well, you know, they don't. No sane human being loves to fail. Nobody wants to fail. The problem is that if you are a startup ec entrepreneur, you are working in a highly dynamic ecosystem where you are bound to fail. So the question is not that you should love failure. You shouldn't. I mean, whenever you can, don't fail, okay? Uh, but you should learn to embrace failure as part of the process where you get towards whatever works it, at any given state of the dynamic ecosystem. And that means that in, in, instead of uh, thinking that failure is somehow cool, it's not, you should figure out a systematic process of how do you analyze the situation whenever things do fail. 
And a great example that I love often to use, that I think like media has sort of misconstrued in this respect, uh, is the way Supercell actually like works with failure. So that's one of the companies that media often likes to write, like how they celebrate failures and they eat cake and pop champagne when they have to kill a game. Well, I mean, killing a game is it's a really painful event for a game team. It's not something you want to celebrate. But what those, those people have figured out is that if you have killed the game, that means that you have failed. And making a thorough analysis of why you failed and sharing that analysis with the entire team in the company up to the point that like, you know, in my understanding, sometimes like, you know, even new employees get to see videos of these uh, analysis of fa failure. So you'll disperse real time information in the organization constantly as you go along. Uh, that helps the other teams and the other people not to fail in the same way. And th then we can all fail in our own particular way. But each failure and each analysis will bring us closer towards a solution that actually works. And that means that by understanding uh, the building things, trying things out, by measuring what happens, seeing what, you know, what, what, what the results are, and then learning from them whether they fail or succeed, and dispersing this information uh, towards our organization, will not only inoculate us against these changes in the world, but it actually gives us the opportunity of leveraging these changes in the world so that by learning to be intrinsically motivated, self-directed, by tapping into these psychological needs, learning the entrepreneurial mindset, understanding to be merciful to ourselves and focus on the two or three things that are the most important right now. And you know, if the rest doesn't get done, who cares? I mean, at the end of the day, you know, anyway, as long as you have two or three top priorities that you ship, you're going to get a ginormous amount of things done, even in a situation of crisis. And ultimately, to understand that if we want to navigate a dynamic ecosystem, we're going to fail, but we can learn from those failures and thus leverage this dynamic to become more dynamic ourselves and to really be able to embrace, you know, whatever black swans the world may next throw our way. Thank you very much.